Ooh, we're recording. It's on right now. All right, so welcome to the second episode of the Growing Pains podcast. I'm here with Chris Barnard. Chris is a modern-day renaissance man as an athlete, coach, creator, and international entrepreneur. He's the co-owner of Strength Camp Gym, which now has locations from coast to coast in the United States and has recently moved into the UK and Canada. Chris is also the CEO of his own company, Overtime Athletes, which aims to bring out the hidden potential of all athletes through training that emphasizes explosiveness and raw strength. Chris is a passionate and knowledgeable coach to pro athletes and high school underdogs, a driven and visionary businessman, and most importantly, a mentor to thousands of young men and women. I'm lucky enough to be able to call him my friend and share with you guys some of his knowledge. Thanks for coming on the show, Chris. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for that intro, Mark. Wow. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I just, know how- off the top of my head, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how I follow up with that. You, you don't have to. That's my job. I know, right? Okay, yeah. cool. So I guess I did give you your intro there, and I think a lot of people know about Strength Camp, but not a lot of people know about your backstory. Maybe if they kind of looked into it a little bit, uh, they might know. But for those of you who don't know, what is Overtime Athletes and what inspired you to start that company? Yes, yeah, so... You know, growing up, obviously, you know, I was into athletics. I played football. I played almost every single sport that you could play um, from a young age, elementary school. I mean, if if it wasn't basketball, it was baseball. If it wasn't baseball, it was football. If it wasn't football, track, volleyball, anything that you could, I mean, boxing, anything that you could offer, I was constantly, you know, playing these sports growing up. Um, just like anybody else, when I got to the high school level, I really started focusing on football. I really started getting into the weight room and the weights, and I realized this would be a tool that would allow me because I was a skinny kid. Um, And I really got into like the muscle magazines and researching. Mind you, I had the internet, but it wasn't as big, so I'm showing my age. Uh, There wasn't much on the internet. You know, everything was about bodybuilding. So what do you do? You start following like bodybuilding style workouts and things of that nature. Um... You know, and I just like I said, I got really into it. I even had a janitor position at a world gym so I could have a membership there and learn training. I was constantly talking to the trainers and these were all, you know, like big roided out bodybuilders at at like your go your global gym. And and this was just my passion. I fell in love with it. And, you know, I started training people outside of my house. I had a little weight set in my backyard. Um, and I just started working with as many people as I possibly could. And that kind of just spiraled into, you know, me wanting to continue to play. So I started trying to play college ball. Um, I got to a certain level junior college. I played out in Arizona. So I'm from Florida. I get injured, which is a career ending injury. And I, um, essentially come back to Florida with still the hopes of trying to play. So here I am searching for another trainer. Uh, Mind you, before I went to Arizona, I was a a trainer at LA Fitness. Uh, So I've already kind of had a taste of like what this training and personal training industry is all about. Uh, So I come back and I'm looking online and I find, I'm looking for a football trainer. You know, here I am in in a sling because I broke my shoulder. Uh, and I'm looking for somebody to kind of, my goal was to play for the university of Miami and I, I, nothing was going to stop me. So I find this guy on the internet, his name's Elliot Hulse. He is a, you know, he specializes in training people for football. So I take my buddy and we drive about an hour South and we walk into a warehouse gym. Now, mind you warehouse gym there. I'd never even seen one of these things before. They had personal training studios, like, you know, that are kind of like you know, glass front, uh, you know, still nice inside. They're kind of studios. It's still machines. I walk into this. It's in like it's in the hood. It's tucked away in like this industrial area. Oh, you walk in, you see tires, you see barbells, you see you know uh, a couple squat racks and a couple dumbbells, and that's it. That's all you see. 
And Elliot went ahead and trained us and we absolutely fell in love with this style of training. I knew about this and I seen what these guys were doing in college online and things of that nature, but I've never really experienced any of it. Uh, and mind you, like I said, I just played, you know, obviously we had a strength and conditioning program in Arizona. So I, I'm starting to see how you start to train for football and things of that nature. But this was just a whole brand new side of things that I've never seen. And I absolutely fell in love with it. Not only that, um, you know, we're just infatuated with being here. Like we're, we're all my entire life at this time was all about working, eating and training and trying to prepare myself for football. And so, you know, naturally I stayed around a lot and I started building a relationship with Elliot. And what I noticed is he started working online or he was working online. Basically what he was doing was selling a football program online, same stuff that he was teaching us and training us in there in the actual gym. He was just making it a DVD and being able to distribute to people all across the world who wanted to learn how to train for football. And I thought this was fascinating to me. This was like the first time I was, I, I was experiencing these, this kind of, you know, marketing. And, uh, and so he trained me, I went away to, uh, Miami and I, uh, you know, went to go try to play, uh, I became in, I made the team, but I became ineligible and, you know, I went through a lot of stuff that first year because that was my only reason of going to school was to play ball. So when that didn't work out, it was kind of one of those things like, where do I go now? And I still decided to go ahead and get my degree. But what I noticed after that first year was I had to do an internship and I took that internship with Elliot. And through that internship, what happened was I got deeper into training people that style. And I got deeper into what they called internet marketing. And that was essentially selling what you're passionate about online and just finding ways to be able to sell to, you know, you know, be able to find an audience, be able to find these guys who are the same boat that I was and be able to offer them maybe a program or something that could support them. So me being my passion, I really went deep into that over that summer and I just studied as much as I possibly could. And all Elliot would do, because Elliot was busy at the time too, but all Elliot would do was just kind of point in a certain direction. He'd be like, okay, yeah, you know, study this guy. Or like when it came time to write a sales page, he pointed me like to this, to this uh, article about 12 steps to writing a sales page. And I just researched everything and learned it. So at that time I was so hungry and it was just one of those where I was burning the candle on both ends. And I was like, I'm going to figure this out one way or another, because this is something I can do all the time. And it was enticing to me because coming from a trainer's experience, I said, man, I don't. I don't I never wanted to train again because a there was a ceiling above me, meaning um, you're capped at how much you can make. Let's let's be honest. I was burnt out training people at L.A. Fitness and I just didn't enjoy working with, you know, house moms who wanted to tell me their problems. My passion was training with athletes. And I thought the only route to that was being a strength and conditioning coach for a college team, which it, even to this day, that's still enticing to me because I absolutely love working with athletes. But those were kind of the only two options. And I, to rewind a little bit, when I went to Miami, I was going for I was going to be a surgeon or that's what I was trying to be. But I chose that because I wanted to have financial freedom. I figured that was something that I could do to make the money that I wanted to. Long story short. So when I went to and learned this thing from Ellie, I realized there's no ceiling. My hustle can dictate how much I make. And I'm able to do what I love. And that was basically the two things that really stuck out to me. And when I went to uh, when I went back to school, I released my first program, TXT, and I released it. And it was seventy seven dollars. And essentially what this was was the program that I kind of developed at my time in Miami and kind of, you know, really be, was able to transform a lot of my athleticism. Like I really focused hard when I was there on training and it really kind of transformed me. So I, I basically recorded everything. I put it out there. You know, I created a marketing, I've created a video, created a sales page and I just put it out there. I think on my social media, which was like Facebook at the time. And I woke up the next day and I think two or three people bought it. So if you're a broke college kid and you get $233 in your bank account overnight and you didn't do anything but post a link on Facebook, 
it's a crazy feeling, right? It's a crazy feeling. So that right there was like, from there on out, I just went hard that entire time at Miami. Like my school suffered, my schoolwork suffered because, uh, because of how, um, how hard I went. Like every single night, I even told myself this, I remember this, that I would tell myself like, hey, if I could go out on a Friday and Saturday night and go like drink and not have a problem with staying out that late, but I can't devote like one of those nights to my new business, Overtime Athletes, then I'm crazy. So what I would do is I would actually like make a drink and on like a Friday night, instead of going out, like, cause I'm in Miami, you know what I mean? There's always shit to do in Miami. So instead of going out, I just like, okay, I'm gonna devote Friday night to like stay up until three o'clock, which three, four, five o'clock in the morning is, is nothing in Miami. And I'm going to actually work and beat on this craft. And before you know it, um, I was able to kind of just learn a bunch of different new tips and tricks and tactics when it comes to uh, internet marketing, getting myself out there. At the time, it was writing blog posts. And I just went hard on that. And then sooner or later, Overtime Athletes was kind of birthed. Um, and then that transformed into me graduating me coming back to St. Petersburg, uh, I struck a deal with Elliot where, you know, I helped him out in some capacity and he helped me out, which was allowing me to train athletes, local athletes in his gym. So I had essentially now at this time, overtime athletes transformed into, I'm training local athletes. So I'm actually doing the thing. I'm still training myself because I still wanted to play at the highest level for the NFL. So I was preparing myself for the combine. And then I had this business where I was doing blog posts and YouTube to get my new internet program out there, which was TXT, uh, Total Explosive Training. So it was a kind of a three-way thing. And that's how my life was for like two years. It was just a matter of just beating on my craft, getting as much out there as I possibly can. I never wanted to recreate the wheel. I just saw what other people were doing and said, hey, I'm just going to be authentic in doing this. Um, and just, that's kind of how it transformed and it was, uh, and yeah, now it's, it's a YouTube channel and it's, it's going pretty well. How I have followers a, you got, Chris. Uh, I think 110,000 subscribers now, which, Hey, for, for, for being able to work, like the way I look at it is if I was able to work with, that's 110,000 people plus because not everybody subscribes. And I always remind myself I'm able to help. 110,000 athletes, probably in the position that I was in, you know, when I was in high school, like I said, I was in the bodybuilding magazines. It was the, it was a, it was a long learning curve for me. I can cut that down for these kids and make them better, bigger, stronger, faster now. And by maybe one tip that I give them. And to me, that's such a blessing. I'm so grateful for that because it's such it, like I said, it's kind of my way of paying it forward because I had to go through that. So if I can cut that down for them, it's a, it's an awesome feeling. And you know what's so crazy too? You're able or you're in that position because a lot of things didn't go right for you when mm -hmm. you look back at it. Mm -hmm. And I remember you telling me the story of how you went out to junior college and you had that shoulder injury and it just seemed like at that moment your life was kind of over. Can you wow. describe what that experience was like where something that you loved so much was taken away from you and how you you grew from that? Yeah, so like when, you know, and I just remember here's the thing and when I went out to Arizona and I never like try to give a sob story. I really hate when guys try to give sob stories because there's always somebody with like way worse, but when I went out to Arizona, it was like it was one of those things where we were in dire straits to try to get into this crack and I didn't know anything. So I'm like, I knew I could play ball. I knew growing up, I was an all-star every single year. Things transpired in high school. I actually had a kind of little bit of trouble pass in high school and was, uh, you know, arrested and things of that nature. And it didn't work out for me in high school, but I said, man, I have to, uh, I have to, you know, I, I still can do this. Mm. And so when I went out to Arizona. It was kind of like one of those things where I was just trying to find, I didn't really know about walk-ons and all these, I didn't know all these avenues now. I didn't know what I know now. And so when I went to Arizona, I had like $300 to my name. I took this old beater car 
And I, like, I'm surprised it even was able to drive out there from Florida. Uh, and it was just a really rough time. Me and two of my buddies, we like shared a room. We slept on the floor. It was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it was just one of those things where it was a really trying time. And I, but it was one of those things where I, I say this because you had to know my energy. I was so hungry for the game and playing Division One football uh, that it was like by any means necessary at that point. And when all was going well and I basically started earning like essentially what I did was I just didn't come off the field uh, after like the second game when it came to offense. And I was playing slot, tight end, H-back. Like they had me in all these different positions. So everything was aligning from all the sacrifice I made. And then when you come into game six and I catch a screen pass and I break my shoulder, I just I just started bawling on the sideline. And it wasn't because it wasn't because I was hurt. It wasn't because I had a bone sticking out of my shoulder. It was purely because I was like, fuck, like that just ended. I just did all of this. I sacrificed. I just got a taste of a little success. And here's the thing, too. I shadowed. The whole high school thing, how that didn't work out because there was a little doubt in me when I got in high school. It was like, you know, like I said, I wasn't as athletic compared to my 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 uh, peers around me, the other people playing football, which I was always more athletic than most. And then for some reason in high school, it was like I shot up. I was like awkward and gangly and skinny and it just didn't work out for me as well. But, I, I, you know, fast forward to college, I'm like, oh, shit, These, this guy has an offer from West Virginia. This guy has an offer to ASU, this guy. And I'm going against these guys and I'm playing against them. And it kind of boosts your confidence. And you're like, damn, all right, good. Like, this is a reminder that I'm on this level and I can play at this level and I'm balling against these guys. Everything's aligning. You get a taste of it. Mm. And then all of a sudden it's like the, the, the rug is uh, pulled from under you. And that was that time that was in that instance where I was like, hey, I can either go this. And I remember sitting in the emergency room at like four in the morning because it was a road game. We had to come back. My trainers didn't even come with me because it's junior college, slap big junior college. So I have to go to the emergency room by myself. It's like four in the morning. It's around Halloween. So all these fucking drunks are in there and they're all like dressed up in costumes and shit from their Halloween parties, like just drunk. And I'm sitting there in my football uniform, like, or like my pants and uh and uh, shirt and shit. And I'm just like, because that was the first thing I did when I got off. And I'm just looking around and I'm thinking, man, like I can either like th- this is the test that you people talk about. Like I can either choose to try to recover from this and like you know do this thing, or I can just lay down and say I gave it my best. Um, and I and, and believe it or not, you know like. Uh, probably two weeks later, I drove home from Arizona, maybe a little bit longer, but I had that long drive from Arizona by myself. So it was kind of like a coming to Jesus moment. So from Arizona all the way to Florida, I had so much time to think for like two days. And it was just like, it was just one of these things where it was like, fuck this, like I'm going, like, I'm going to figure this out. I knew I could play on that level. Uh, I knew I was good enough. And, and it was kind of, and it was one of those things where I was just like, I made that decision decision on that time like I'm gonna come back from this harder than ever I still have two years so that first year was spent all rehabbing and working and everything like that and then you know that's where I got into the second year yeah and uh, it was just one of those crazy moments and and like I said it was a it was a trying time but uh you know you always can look back and say damn I wish I would have known this 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 and this a laundry list of things and that's why I push kids to like not be stifled and just go all the way in it. Because even though I committed on a physical level, meaning I'm going to go do this, I still had this repression and this unworthiness that I carried with me as a child. And probably I developed in that high school days to go like put myself out there in front of a coach as to, oh, what might they think? Like, who is this kid think he is type deal? So you still kind of repress those and my thing is like, just go do it. Just go do it. Be audacious. Like, don't fear anything. Don't fear what other people think. Because at the end of the day, none of those coaches, none of those people matter anymore. Like, I don't see them anymore. <laughs> but I carry on my life story. They don't. Mm. Uh, it was a huge thing that I, I felt like, you know, I try to pass off to these guys. Yeah, that's awesome. And one thing, ever since I, I met you for the first time when I went down to Florida, 
I've always known you as one of the, the most driven, hardworking people I've ever met in my life. And that's, I'm not, I'm not talking out of my ass there. It's, it's definitely <laughs> true. And it's interesting because I always wondered, what do you attribute that to? Because it's not as if you come from a long line of football players, really. I know your grandpa played a little bit, but what do you attribute your just hardworking, grinding mentality to? Yeah, I think, uh, well, one, I'll say that I came from a very blue collar um, background. You know, my father and mother are very like, it was just one of those where they instilled some values in me where it's like, you have to work to get shit. And not to say like I grew up in the, in the ghetto, like I literally was at a small young age when I realized my, my pops moved down here to Florida. We didn't have anything. And I remember, you know, like him getting us a room in a motel, a shitty motel for a couple nights because, you know, he's still figuring things out. But for him to be able to go from that to, hey, we rent a house for a year, which is in a little bit better side of town, to all of a sudden he's buying a house. And to see him kind of take the family and be able to do that with three kids and just kind of one of those like build your way up. He came from very kind of grassroots. My mother, their side, my grandfather on that side and everything, he was pretty successful. But for him to kind of lead our family and like, hey, we're going to make this work and then be able to go to kind of like a suburbs and, you know, just kind of like a blue collar suburbs and and really just kind of grind and chip away at a manual labor job for 30 plus years. Hell, I'll share this with you because we're, we're close, but, uh, you know, my father recently got sick and the day he was diagnosed, the day after he was diagnosed with that same day he was diagnosed with terminal cancer, he was out looking at a job. So he was out like, I have to go look at this job. And that's just how he showed his love. Like he was a very kind of stoic man where it was like, Hey, I'm not the most, um, you know, physically loving and, and showing that kind of love uh on that level it was more or less like i'm gonna sh i'm gonna get up every single day and go to work and so as my maturity got i realized that in him and i was always grateful for that even as a kid every time every job i had it was like you know you want to make your pops proud so when i worked with him it was just one of those where it was like hey if i work just a little bit harder than him or as hard as him like he, you know he'll acknowledge me so you carry that you carry a lot of things from your youth and, uh, and I carry that over to all the other jobs. And I, every other job I ever had, uh, people were like, you know, I remember working in lawn, lawn service industry. Oh, that sucks so bad. But like, I, I would make it a point where even if I was acting it at the time, I would want to hear that feedback from the boss, man, to say like, oh, that kid's like working his ass, like that kid's unstoppable. He works his ass off, blah, blah, blah. And then I think as it transpired and for me, what I noticed was, you know, at first it was really hard to take that uh, for myself and my own craft as an entrepreneur when I started my own business and apply that to mine. And it was just one of those things where two things came to me that really were really stood out when I actually got my own businesses. One, the first coming the aha moment I had was when I said, you're, you'll work for another man harder than you'll work for yourself. And that's what I was speaking to myself. And when that clicked, it was like, oh, shit. And that's when I started that thing in Miami where I was like, I was working all night. You know, that's when I was like, any moment I had, I was like, okay, I'm going to beat on this. Because like I said, you could go do a 10-hour shift at a restaurant, but you won't do that for your own business. Like, that's mm -hmm. crazy. The other one that I've always kind of lived with is like, it's not to me about the money, it's more about the freedom. And right now, the game that we play in this world, you need money to have that freedom. It's just what it is, you know what I mean? And uh, it's just numbers in the sky, but at the end of the day, those numbers in the sky can, can get you, uh, you know, can allow you to take off a weekend or go do whatever you want to do. And, uh, and so that was kind of one of those things where it's like, if it's... If it's out there, why settle for mediocrity? Mm. You know what I mean? That some people get really like, oh, I'm not attached to it. And I'm not attached to it. I have everything that I need. But at the same time, I think there's a level of me that's just like, I don't want to settle for being you know, mediocrity. If it's out there, why not go try to strive for something big? And uh, I've always set large goals, lofty goals, even if I haven't reached them. 
uh, very audacious goals. And so, you know, I'm, I'm constantly having those. And even if I put those out there, so when I go do that on a yearly basis, I don't, I don't set a mediocre, uh, a mediocre goal. Mm. I'm like, Oh, I want, I want, you know, millions of dollars. That's what was the game. <laughs> and right? so that's how I look at it. That's so cool because I think you got, not that you were lucky, but it was cool for you because you got to see your dad transition from moving you guys down to Florida to wow. where he was at today, being a successful guy. And I think not a lot of people get that experience. They usually, you just grow up, you don't really know what your dad does. He kind of goes away to work every day, comes home, nothing really changes your life is kind of the same and it kind of follows that progression. Whereas for you, you got to see the struggle and the come up mm -hmm. firsthand as a kid. And mm -hmm. I think that really plays into your character and uh, the person you are today. So absolutely, man. And I, I attribute a lot to that. Cause like you said, like I just said, there's so much emotion that's birthed out of being able to see that, that you carry on in your life. Like I said, just you know, from a, a worthy standpoint of myself, you always want your father's acknowledgement. And like I said, he's a guy who doesn't show love. So this is the way that I was able to get that love. You know what I mean? And that kind of made, you know, drove me. People can really say like a lot of things like, "Oh man, I remember doing this, this, and this," and I never want to go back to that. Yes, there's a case of that, but at the end of the day, my needs were were met as far as at home, it, there, there wasn't really, uh, later down in life, you know what I mean? Like I said, I was super young when we first moved down here. So my brother and sister who are six years older than me could possibly tell you some, some, uh, uh, different stories about maybe like that come up and, you know, they were obviously a lot longer, a, a lot further along than I was, but I was too young to kind of remember some of those things where it was like, Oh, I remember coming home and not having dinner on the dinner and we went to bed hungry. That, that kind of stuff didn't really apply to me, but I remember the just of it, you know, mm. from what I remember as my youth. And, uh, and I, like I said, being able to see, you know, being in a mature state now and being able to see the, what he was able, what he had to do and the decisions he had to make as a man really drove me to say, wow, that like, I'm able to appreciate that more on this level. Yeah, that's amazing. And just to switch gears a little bit right now, when I first came down, or the second time I came down to strength camp for my internship, it was you, Danny, Shannon at the gym, and then I showed up, and I think two weeks after that, we moved from the old gym to the new gym. You and Elliot conveniently went to Panama that weekend, so we got to move everything. <laughs> Anyways... Uh, <laughs> but we had, we had no members pretty much. And I remember, uh, standing with you in the old gym and just asking you all these questions like, how are we going to differentiate ourselves from CrossFit and what's going to make us stand out in the community? And I just felt like I was being annoying, but uh, I remember having really good conversations with you and to see coming from there to where strength camp is now. What has that experience been like for you going from managing yourself to, I don't know how many people you manage now, how many people are, are looking up to you right now? We have probably, I say total in the team, 10 or 11. I mean, it's, it comes and goes because of the interns. Yeah. Uh, but like actually we're paying probably like 11. Yeah, so what has that experience been like from managing you to managing yeah. 11 people right now? Oh, um, man, I'm still learning. I'm yeah. still learning. I got to be honest, though, like you, 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 uh, you know, you kind of gave a insight into how we, we were doing things. I was extremely – and I'm not just saying this because it's you. First of all, I'll say like when you ask me questions – I always loved our banter because it wasn't small talk with you. Like it was always one of these things where it's like if you, if somebody's ever met you, you like genuinely care. You're not just asking questions out of thin air because you know me. I I'm so busy. I hate the small talk. <laughs> and like a lot of people, because I'm I'm with Elliot a lot, you know. And Elliot, he gets a large crowd. And for me, I'm I'm kind of like people call it like uh, I think Kendrick calls it like a. 
ex, uh, oh, what the hell does he call it in this thing? Basically, he calls himself an extrovert who's an introvert. Mm. So, like, if you see me out, if you see me out, I'm, I'm not going to go out of my way to go small talk people. I just don't, I don't really like that shit. But I'll connect with one pe- person or something like that, and we'll spend the whole weekend together. And we did that. We did that at the first seminar that you came to, and I was like, yo, this dude, like, we vibe on that level. Uh, and, you know, I usually get those other guys who are just like, how do you jump higher? Like, you, don't, you don't really care. You're just trying to talk to me about something. Like, I'm sorry, but I just don't. I'm not that kind of dude. You know what I mean? Like, be real with me. If there's something you want to talk about, cool. If not, you don't have to say much. It is yeah. what it is. But, uh, yeah, but, like, going into that and, like, when you came and, uh, you know, I got to share something with you. It's just a. It was. It was just a leap of faith and faith and, uh, and like being courageous. And it was just one of those where it was like, all right, let's do this. We're gonna go from a thousand square foot, no members. To I'm gonna get these two guys down. I'm gonna put them on internship and then I'm gonna offer them coaching positions. And then <laughs> we're gonna do this gym. We're gonna make this work. And I'm gonna figure this shit out whether like whether we know it or not. And I remember just butting my heads with you guys. And some like sometimes we had some amazing moments and sometimes we were in the trenches and it was tough. And I was like, fuck, like, you know, and what I realized I was like I said, I was going to say I was extremely blessed to have you two guys as you and Shannon as like the two kind of guys that I first started working with, because while you were so different, it it allowed me to see like. I'm a different personality in the way that I operate. You're a different personality in the way that you operate, and so is Shannon. And so to have three different characters in that mix, it was one of those where it was just, uh, it was amazing to to kind of see how that unfolded. And uh, I always had to keep myself aware of what was going on, meaning no matter what is going on, I have to be able to look objectively at, hey, what's going on, and, and see your guys' strengths. And through that, I was able to kind of start to realize, because here's the thing, I managed, I was a kitchen manager at a restaurant uh, before that, and I was also a manager at LA Fitness of personal trainers, but it's a much different management role. Somebody else created the system, I come into it, this is what it is, it's very black and white, cut and dry. With this, you know, I mean, if you weren't doing it, here's the consequence. With doing this, I'm building it kind of from scratch, and I'm working with two guys who are basically like, "Hey, are we down for this?" Yes, we're both down. We're all we're all on the same ship, and so it's just a matter of like, there was a lot more. Like, I had a emotional, I was emotionally invested in you guys to see you guys come up, and I knew if you guys became better, smarter, more productive people, it's going to overall help the gym, mm. and. Uh, and through that, you know, I've always kind of been able to, and as we built strength camp further along in OTA, now I have three, four guys on payroll for OTA, which is pretty crazy to me. Um, you know, that was just a one man band. And then to, to see that kind of, as I get one, each person in, my biggest thing is, A, I don't want them to treat it like just a job. I want them to feel like each person is kind of based off performance, meaning your hustle will dictate how much you make. Uh, and then two, just kind of making sure that, Hey, here's kind of our mission and what we're up to. Are you down for this? Because here's the thing, there's going to be times where there's, you're going to get tried and like everybody's personality, no matter what, uh, is going to rub you the wrong way at some point. And some people are going to make you feel real good. But what you got to do is you got to just kind of be aware. And I always tell my guys, I always say like, Hey, I remember, you know, six years ago, I was cutting grass. And if you if you are able to take yourself out of this and look at it and say, we're in the gym industry, in the fitness industry, we're really helping people on a visceral level. And uh, at the end of the day, we are free to do what we want and we just hustle. And I'm not trying to treat you like a boss or I'm not trying to really create this hierarchy. I'm more or less trying to create a team where we can have one unit moving towards one goal. And through that, you're going to experience difficulties. But if you look at it objectively, it's a pretty fucking cool business to be a part of. And, uh, and you know, sometimes you get um, into these, you know, weeks and months into the grind where it's like, you know, 
you could get irritable. All these things can happen. But at the end of the day, you got to remind yourself, I could be cutting grass. You know? <laughs> and and uh, and it's and it's been a tough road to be able to learn how to manage and be able to talk to guys and stuff like that. And I'm still in the process of going through it. But I notice with myself, the more that I can be present with my team, as opposed to I got to go focus and do everything, the better I am in, in sitting where they're at and just kind of uh, – you just working with where they're at and being able to be a human with them and, and kind of, you know, I, I trust my decision making as I elevate myself and amplify my morals and values. So I try to take each thing individually um, and, uh, and continue to try to push them along. And the other biggest thing that I could say is you have to understand that and, it, and not, not everybody, and it's a kind of cliche saying like there's too many chiefs and not enough Indians. I want to empower my guys to be chiefs. However, I realized just like myself, I had to pay my dues when I was an Indian. And what that means is I, I can't just expect each guy to come in and say, oh, this dude's going to crush it. I don't need to do anything of him. I just need to tell him what I need and let him go do that. No, no, no. What you have to do is you have to create a structure and a system for them to operate out of that they can go ahead and then flex their strengths through and operate out of until they become to a certain point, right, of maturity and entrepreneur skills and all that nature until they can get to that point where they can then run shit themselves. Mm. And that was my biggest mistake in the future because I just thought guys would come in like me. And, and even then, like I said, I went through a long history of working where I just was the Indian. And I take all those experiences with me until I was able to develop systems that other guys can operate out of. And there's nothing wrong with that. That was hard for me. Like I, I at first it was hard for me in this business to tell people exactly what to do, especially when it was based off of performance. Because if I was based off performance, meaning my hustle dictates how much I make at the end of the year, uh, I would want all free reign. But what I have to tell these guys is, do you trust me? Do you trust what I have? And then when that starts to click, I gain their trust a little bit more, and then that's when it becomes a well-oiled machine. Yeah, and that's that's definitely one of the biggest things for a manager, I think. And I saw that in you as you managed us over those two years was you were you were focused on what you were doing, but at the same time you had a good ability to take a step back and realize that each one of us was on our own separate journey. And I think, like you said, when we had struggles in terms of working together, it was because we were all focused too much on ourselves, on our own journeys, and not focused enough on, okay, where's this guy at right now? What's he going through? What's he feeling? What's motivating him? What, what's going on with him right now? And I think, I think a lot of people forget that, and it's good... Uh, and it was good to see you make that transformation and continue to make that transformation today. And one thing I've always been really intrigued with in terms of your character and what you like to do is your daily rituals and your daily habits. What would you say is one thing that you do on a daily basis that keeps you productive and grounded when you have a million different things going on all at once? Yeah, I'm going to give you two things because this is the two things that's really transformed myself. And, uh, and uh, it's, it, you know, there's, a, there's layers of things that you obviously can make you more productive and things of like that. But these are two things that I do on a daily basis that absolutely help me. One is in the morning I create a morning ritual. Um, I write it out. I say exactly what it is. To the T, this sounds crazy. At first, it was just like, hey, wake up, walk, you know, uh, you know, listen to Headspace for 10 minutes and then grab a protein shake. But as I get more mature in it, and if I can offer something to anybody listening, especially at that age, get extremely tight on a, a morning routine. And I used to think like, man... At first, when I first started off in business, I was like, just do whatever. This is why you're in this business is because you want to do whatever. But what I notice is, you know, Monday through Friday, like clockwork, it's a morning routine. And it, it's constantly changing, you know, depending on where I'm at in my life. Uh, you know, two, a year ago, it was, you know, walk, meditate, 
same living fuel shake that I'm having and then listen to uh, an audio book on my way to work. And that's kind of changed until now. It's like I wake up immediately. I'm doing 15 minutes of some form of uh, like a still meditation for myself. And then even down to my hygiene, as far as like brushing the teeth, uh, washing my face, everything is down to the teeth. What I consume in the morning, on my way to work, being able to listen to something. But make sure each step of those is productive to adding to you. So it's personal development. So I try to knock all of that out my first hour of the day. So A, I'm um, um, basically being able to kind of calm my mind down, the incessant mind stream that I have. And we've talked a lot about these things, but basically being able to allow myself to be present and slow that, that my, the, you know, I'm not thinking in the future and I'm not thinking in the past, right? So uh, I'm not stressing about any of that. I'm trying to ground myself each and every morning. Then, you know, obviously taking care of myself, just that small fact of taking care of myself drinking some water, washing my face, brushing my teeth, flossing my teeth, all those things. It's just kind of one of those mental aspects where I'm, I'm treating myself and I'm taking care of myself. So it's not like I'm feeling like a piece of shit or anything like that. You know what I mean? And then I'm, cons and then I'm, uh, you know, going to my drive to the office. Uh, I'm, I'm listening to something that's going to support me in business. And by doing that, I'm exposing myself to new ideas. And in this game or in anything you do, you have to have a level of exposing yourself to new ideas. I was always against that. I always hated that shit because I always looked like there's so many kids out there now, especially millennials, that just consume so much knowledge but never produce. I was always a producer. I was always just like, fuck it, I'm going to do it even if I'm not ready. And now what I noticed is I have to have – I have to consume certain level of knowledge. So that's where that kind of comes into play. Um, and then the second thing that really, really supported me is, uh, is, or, or is, is essentially, uh, writing out my day, my, my next day at night. So every single night I have a planner, right? And I, and I bought this dope ass, you know, leather planner I spent a little bread on it. Cause if I spend a little money on it, then I know I'm going to use it. And I essentially open it out, put it on my office or my kitchen counter and I have a pen there that's tucked in there every single night. And what I do is the minute I get home, I drop my backpack off. I go put that on the counter. And throughout the rest of my afternoon night, when an idea comes to me or something that I need to do, I'll write it in. Or if I don't like have those come to me, I'll actually sit for 10 minutes and just say – and and essentially what I do is I have each of my businesses – kind of marked off of what I, I allot time to them. So for instance, overtime athletes, I allot 25 minutes per day. Strength Camp Media, 30 minutes per day. Strength Camp International, 30 minutes per day. Uh, and then Strength Camp Gym, you know, depending on what the day is and stuff like that, you know, 30 minutes. Or those times change, obviously. But I just go through each one and I write, okay, what's one thing that I can do for this business or what's the most pressing issue or something that I can do that's going to support me down the road for that particular business. And by doing that, it allowed me, I don't know if anybody's ever read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I know you have, but uh, it allows me to go in quadrant two, which quadrant two is essentially, I'm not running around putting fires out. I do a lot of that during the day, especially having a team. So what this does is my first couple hours, my first two, three hours, I knock out everything on my list that I organized the night before. I'm able to kind of streamline focus. And what by doing that, I'm only working like three, four hours, three hours in the morning. So I wake up, you know what I mean? I'm at the office by seven. I'm done by 10. And then the rest of my time, when I have that and I feel like that was a super productive time, I'm able to go to the gym now or I'm able to be at the gym and work with my guys and be there with them without having to go around and run around and put fires out. Mm. And um, that has really kind of transformed me. Those two things right there have really transformed the way that I'm able to pump out work, um, the way that I'm able to operate, um, you know, and kind of slow things down. Uh, there was a time where it was just 
constant grind on like 10 hours. But then what you do in between those 10 hours is you check your social media, you're going here, you're going there, you do things within that and then you, but you're putting in those 10 hour days and you're like, what happened? So I realized, I just was like, again, became objective of myself and I was like, A, this isn't healthy because I'm constantly running around like a chick. I get shit done, but it's like, there's got to be a more efficient way of doing this. And so by putting those kind of, I was able to cut my day into a third of that, a quarter of that, and then say, hey, I can get all this done. And then I kind of leave myself open the rest of the day. And, uh, and that's really kind of transformed. You know, in two years from now, that might transform even more, but uh, evolve even more. But where I'm at, like, that, I, I, I kind of have, like, a real efficient system down. And it's able to, for me, to push that forward really hard. Yeah. No, that's really good. And I think another thing that kind of you've always – preach to us is goal setting and how that affects your day-to-day life and you always talk about intrinsic versus extrinsic goals could you explain a little bit to the people out there what the difference is between those two things and how you use those to keep yourself motivated and on track and headed in a certain direction yeah absolutely so you know when I first started off especially in college like I I think sports is what have like allowed me to really uh, have goals and and kind of like hey you got to be working towards something um, even if it's you know whatever it is and uh, and I've always been huge on goals I think there's just something there about like the thrill of accomplishing and I think there's also a thrill of like you know just in the world like a lot of people say things aren't aren't uh, you, you can't do that or, you know, that kind of deal. So it's like, uh, it's one of those things where goals, uh, I got deep into them because I said, okay, there's a way to, instead of just hoping for something, you're making it tangible. You're setting a goal and you're finding a way to work towards that goal. And I, I think the more audacious I got, the more geeked I got about, uh, like trying to achieve these things and trying to, um, you know, I just liked accomplishing them. And so through that, when I first started, you know, the goal was, hey, I want to make a million dollars before I turn 30 years old. And then that was like the first business goal I made long term, I think, when I first started it. Uh, and then it became, you know, I started doing it on a yearly basis. And I saw what these other entrepreneurs were doing. And basically, they set business goals every single year. You hear about this. You read about this, everything. So I was like, okay, I got to do this. So my goal was usually like what I make per year money. It started with that. Then it evolved to what are some other things I want? Oh, I want a new truck. I want to live on the water. I want to, you know, it started expanding. And what I realized is these were all goals that were essentially fulfilling me kind of externally. They're extrinsic goals. It's funny, I watched a documentary uh, on Netflix and it was called Happy. And basically what Happy explains is there's these researchers and scientists that essentially study people who are generally happy. And they went around the globe and they study these people who have long lives and um, are extremely healthy and enjoy themselves and this and that. And what they basically found out was there was three intrinsic um, things that these people had in common that make them happy. And that was helping others, uh, relationships, and personal development. So obviously helping yourself personally, um, helping some form of helping others, and then some form of you know relationships that you have with your friends and family. These were all strong things they had. So then what I did in 2015 was I said, oh, I can have my extrinsic goals, which I broke down into money, status, and money, status, and uh, something else similar to status. But then I I broke my (laughs) intrinsic goals into those three categories, helping others, relationships, and personal development. And what I noticed is it had like, and this is something, like I said, I keep a planner and this is a sheet that I keep in my planner that I look at every single day and I reflect on these and how, and it kind of puts me in the gear like, oh shit, you're not doing this. You should probably go, you know, focus on this a little bit. 
But uh, what that did to me is, is it gave me a great balance and it gave me a great, uh, a fulfilling um, outlook to look forward to. You know, uh, having those types of goals, it was just one of those shut my brain off and I said, okay, yes, it does make sense to have personal development goals. Okay, yes, it does make sense to have, uh, you know, goals with my relationships. And it's just little weaknesses I have that I set for goals for these. So, for instance, with relationships, it was like, hey, I want to reach out to one friend. I have bad, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, autonomy over my friends. Meaning, like, if I, like, high school friends, unless you're my close group, like, I probably won't keep up with you anymore. And I've met a lot of people. I don't network well. So it was one thing. It was like, hey, just acknowledge one friend from, you know, Facebook a month. And so simply once a month, I just reach out and I just write them a little note and say, hey, man, I, I see what you're doing. I love what you're doing. Hope all is well. If I can ever help out in anything, you know, let's link up for this. So that was just one thing that was so stupid, but it opened up a whole new world to me. Mm. And, uh, you know, helping others. So once a quarter, overtime athletes, basically me and Josh uh, at this point, <laughs> Uh, I think a couple of us went went last time, but what I do is I do a pizza and beer night for homeless. So I didn't want to give to no charity, and I was like, how the hell am I going to help others where I, instead of forcing myself, I actually want to do it? So I did a pizza and beer night. So you know there's a lot of homeless people in downtown St. Pete. So I buy like 20 pizzas, and I buy like a couple cases of beer, and I walk around, and I just give them a couple slices of pizza and a couple beers. And like to me, that's like cooler than giving like – money or clothes or some shit is actually it's actually kind of cool to see them smile and shit like that like oh shit nobody's ever brought me pizza and beer and <laughs> if hell if i was homeless that's what i'd want on a friday night you know what i mean so, i'll keep that in mind <laughs> <laughs> but then you know it was just one of those things like i said it was one of those things that i was able to add to myself and kind of keep myself structured for the year and i would look back and and when i got done with it i, I spend uh, some time every single year doing this and I just look back and I say to myself, is this something that like over this year I could be, you know, I don't want to say content, but I could just be like, wow, that was a dope year. Like we got a lot. I got a lot done. I was able to progress myself again. We're playing this game of life. And to me, why not, you know, play it hard you know, instead of like be just, just walking through life um, and just enjoying it and being able to be grateful for a lot of the things. So I think that's what those balance of of uh, goals is able to allow for me. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's something that a lot of people probably forget about when they're setting goals is to have those intrinsic goals as well. Because it's cool to say, I want to make a hundred grand a month or I want to make a million dollars by this time. But for most people, sure, that'll motivate you a little bit, but it's not, it's not going to hit at the root of why you're here and what you need to be doing to help him, uh, to help other people. And, and I think that's why you've been so successful is because you've been, yes, focused on extrinsic goals, but you've also been focused on how can I help these people who are perhaps struggling with the same exact thing I was struggling with uh, wow. 10 years ago. So the last question I kind of had is, since you're this international businessman now, you had the chance to work with a lot of cool people like Bedros, uh, Bedros Koulian and Lewis Howes and I don't know who else, but a lot of other people. What is something you've taken away from working with people who are maybe a step ahead of you or at the same level as you as opposed to constantly managing people who are trying to get to kind of where you're at? What have you learned from working with people at that yeah. next level? It's just that it's the one thing and, and like I'll add this, Bedros is a complete G. Like he's a he's a great businessman. He's I'm I'm you know, I am constantly blown away by a lot of these guys that I meet who who are like, you know, who have like those same entrepreneur skills. Uh, but the the great thing about that is, and this isn't me putting myself on a pedestal, it's just like that it's just that. They're just a step ahead. Mm. They're just a little bit more experienced. They're just a couple more years in the game. I, I I was able to come. This was another aha moment for me recently. Uh, I read the book about Elon Musk. Now, somebody like Elon Musk, 
I'll never be, and I'm completely cool with that. Like, I didn't grow up reading sci-fi books and, and drawing rocket ships and being fascinated with that. You know what I'm saying? I was around chasing tail and trying to get bread and I, that, that kind of game. And I was trying to be cool and popular and all that shit. That's who I am. That's just who I am in this life. So it's okay for me to not have that inactability where it's like, I'm not Albert Einstein. I'm not Tesla. I'm not Elon Musk. What I am is I'm a blue collar kid who has a grind and a work ethic and and I love to, to, you know, go and enjoy myself with other people. It's just being able to identify myself with where I'm at. And then when you see those other guys that you identify with, it, it was one of those moments where it was like, ah, okay. I don't – to be on that level, you don't necessarily need to be some savvy scientist. You could be exactly who you are and just grind your, your way out. So I'm right where I need to be right now. And once I see these other guys, everybody has their own gift. It's about accepting yours and then just amplifying the shit out of it. Because you could sit around in life and you could try to be that scientist. And if you truly have that passion, then so be it. But for me, it was like I'm not going to create a colony on Mars. You know what I'm saying? It's just not what I'm, it's not in my cards. It's not what I'm going to do. But I'll tell you what: I love who the hell I'm becoming. I love who uh, you know. I love being able to. While he's trying to save people on a, on that big of a level, I'm over here like trying to work with the you know the 16, 17 year old kid who's coming up underneath me. It's like, hey, if I can share this with you, or if you're going through this with college ball right now, maybe I can offer something. And my cards are it's made me relatable with a generation that's younger than me. Meaning, I could have been like a dork or something like that, but no, I, mean, I was blessed with the ability to kind of be cool with a lot of younger guys and they're, they're able to kind of look at me and be like, oh shit, I can relate with this guy. He's not like, on, he's not in some upper level. And I'm able to experience that with guys that I've been connecting and networking with recently. It's even though they're different from me, I'm able to see, uh, uh, oh wow, he, his hustle has got him where he's at. And that's what I kind of wanted to be, and that's where I identify with is my hustle gets me where I'm at. You know, it's not because I was born with this inactability to do mathematic problems or something like that. It was just, hey, this was my gift. I'm able to crack away and chip away at my craft every single day. And being able to see higher level guys has allowed me to do that. So my intelligence comes from beating on my craft on a daily level. My intelligence wasn't, you know, I wasn't, it didn't come easy to me. Even in high school, I always said this. I was never great in high school. Like, I couldn't show up for a test and just be like I, the whiz kid. But I'll tell you what, it was a, it was a, such a dichotomy because here I am with all, like, the jocks and, the, you know, the popular group and shit, but I'm top 20 in class. And so, you know, obviously my friends are, like, bullies and shitty in school, but all of a sudden they're, like, they're they're calling me like square root and bullshit like that because I'm getting like I'm getting like a 4.0 and I'm in IP classes. The reason I say that is because I understood the game. I understood like at a young level like okay, if I want to get a scholarship, I have to get good grades. So if I get good grades, how do I get good grades? Oh, I have to get a good grade on the test. So let me figure out a way to take this test so I can get the grade that I need to put me into college. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, hey, do my best because my parents are down my neck and, and, and I'm a whiz kid, blah, blah, blah. It was, hell, in eighth grade, I joined a math team because if I joined a math team, I would get extra credit towards that, that class. And it's like I did little shit like that and I finag – I don't want to say finagle because I just had a great deal of common sense of how to get where I'm at. And I'll put in the work and the hustle behind it to, to, to whatever it is I have to do. So learning, I come, I'm all over the place right now, but uh, <laughs> to learn from other guys, it's just cool to be able to see them and then make it realistic because a lot of times with you and the internet, it can separate you and you think and you build up this perception about somebody, right? And you're like, holy shit, like this guy just has some, some alien thing with him that he was born with that got him there, you know? And that's a, that's a bullshit excuse within yourself. But when you actually meet these people and you're like, oh, this guy doesn't have anything that I, I don't. He's just a little bit further along than me. Mm. You know, 
So once you are able to kind of get around those things, see what the problem is most people meet these guys or see them or they just consume their knowledge on the internet or see them at a seminar in front of a lot of people and you're not doing that shit. So you're like, oh my gosh, there's 500 people in here. He just killed a speech. Like he's on a different level. When you're actually able to kind of like have a cup of coffee or, or just have, enjoy lunch and like, hey, like put your guard down. You're vulnerable. We're cool. Everything's cool. And you obviously reciprocate that. Like you, you, you being the person you are, me being the person I am allows somebody to kind of be comfortable. Then you're able to say like, oh, shit, he's just a little bit further along. And I think that's the biggest thing that a lot of these guys, a lot of these young kids have to realize. Like there's not some inact talent. There's not some – um, you know, there's nothing crazy like that. When you accept your passion and your path, you realize the guys ahead of you are just a little bit further ahead of you. That's it. Mm. And what I got from that is, and what I've always seen in your character is, if you're willing to just trust in yourself and who you are and be comfortable with who you are and work with what you have, then that's going to take you where you need to go. And that may not necessarily be exactly what you have in mind, but it's going to take you somewhere and you just have to love yourself and be comfortable enough to say, you know what, I'm going to work hard at this and wherever it takes me, that's where I'm going to end up. And Absolutely. it's probably better than you even expect. Absolutely. And here's, here's the one thing I'll say, and, and let me see if I can get this across right. We right now are as like this millennial generation there's such a quick fulfillment, need for fulfillment. And I believe that through that, like, I mean, think about it, like Snapchat, it's so fast. It's like, it's gone like that. I think the one positive of that is these young entrepreneurs aren't as attached to the outcome or attached to the changes that are made as you're an entrepreneur. And let me come full circle. Guys 50 years ago, they put their all into a business and it's do or die and mm -hmm. I built up this huge brick and mortar and if it doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. We're at such an amazing time you know, and, and their life is devastated if that doesn't work. We're at such an amazing time where if something doesn't work out, you can easily pivot and move to another idea and forget about the shit that you were doing last year. I mean, you can constantly try things over and over and over. And that persistence and trusting in yourself is what's going to put you on a higher level. I watched recently watched the movie Founder. And it's obviously about Ray Kroc and the McDonald's. And it was such an amazing story because while this is in like, I want to say it was the, the 30s or 40s, maybe even the 50s. I'm not sure what the era was, but... I think it was the 60s. Was it 60s? Well, it was 60s. But the amazing thing about that was, was like, here you have this guy who's chipping away at all these different businesses and his wife's giving him shit. And the whole thing is about like, you know, he was trying to sell milkshakes. And then before that, it was some other kind of bullshit gig. And before that was some kind of other bullshit gig. You could see this recurring in many movies, Pursuit of Happiness. These guys, even at that time, had the persistence to keep going. And that's all the difference it was. Now we're in a we're in a we're in a day and age where you need to have that same persistence. It's just moving at a much faster level. So it only takes one of those things to click, but you just gotta keep going. And like my hope for you, like for instance, you I love that you're audaciousness and you keep trying different things. You know what I'm saying? Now you now it's like this podcast. It's like, bro, I can see how this could click. And, and, you know, here's the thing is just have that persistence to keep going on and trying new things until you find that one thing that will work for you. I had a YouTube channel for a long time where I didn't get traction. I stopped it for a little bit. I started for a little bit. It's still not like anything huge, but 110,000. It's like, oh, shit. Like, I would have never guessed that a couple years ago. I thought that nobody was really paying attention. And, uh, you know, here we are with six gyms, six strength camps. Five years from now, I hope to look back and, and say, hey, there's a thousand. But at the same time, you can you can quickly pivot and you can quickly uh, – you're not as attached to mm. a lot of the outcomes. So that's a, that's a great feeling, especially the time we're in right now. That's the crazy thing too is I think people get the idea that everything is just this smooth, straight line right. up in terms of 
effort that you're putting into things like like you said with your YouTube channel sometimes you fell off it a little bit sometimes yeah. you came back but it wasn't as if you were just totally a hundred percent focused on that one thing and if that wasn't what was doing it for you then nothing was working because you probably were just trying different things in that time for a bit maybe you were more into the blogging for a bit you were doing this or that so I think for anyone out there I think they just need to realize that it's not just this straight shot to the top. It's going to take you trying different things and being willing to put yourself out there in a new sphere and try something different because I think once you, not that you fail at something, but something doesn't click with you, you feel like, shit, well, you know, if that doesn't work, then what else is going to work? So it's all about trying new things. and. It's so funny that last little part you were telling me about, uh, about people being on the next level, it probably because I've been consuming way too much Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather, <laughs> pre and post fight analysis. It just reminded me so much of when Conor McGregor said, he's not that fast. He's not that powerful. He's just more composed than I am. And what that made me think of is him having such absolute faith in his skill set and his ability that he realizes, okay, I don't think Floyd Mayweather's physically or innately better than me. He's just been doing this for 20 years, his entire life. He's more composed. He's more experienced. So when you see another person on another level, like you look and you see Elon Musk, you have to realize as an individual that that person is not innately different than you for the most part. That person is just more composed they're more experienced. They've been in the game for 20, 30, 40 years longer than you have. And it's just a matter of you trusting and being comfortable in your own skin and putting in the years and putting in the work and you'll eventually get to where you're going to get. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And like going back to your point before, like you said, you know, the one thing I say is like people say is it was our overnight success 30 years in the making. Because it's like that one thing clicks, but you don't know what was going on 30 years prior. It's not like you just woke up one day and here's a great idea. I think a lot of kids realize that's a misconception. No, just get in the trenches and get your hands dirty and something will shake as long as you're persistent enough. I always think that's going to happen for anybody. And then, yeah, the one thing I always loved about the Conor McGregor and Floyd thing was like Floyd was like when those lights come on, you're not going to be used to that. What people don't realize what he's trying to say on like, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a different level of boxing is like is exactly what you just said it's composure it's yo i'm used to this game it's a completely different ball game i've played it a lot more you can't just expect to come in and do this now everybody has a pump puncher's chance obviously you can you can connect with me at one particular time but the biggest thing that he said was look I, this is just my you're coming into my realm that's why when you see sports what what is the you know when people say sports they say oh it's a home game they got to travel. It's because they're used to playing in their home turf. Like it's it's not that you're you're no matter what anybody has a pipe puncher's chance when it's a home game. You know what I'm saying? So it's mm -hmm. one of those things where you get comfortable in your realm, and when you do that, you're able to execute at a lot higher level. And it's because you're more calm. It's not because your emotions are more heightened. It's because right. you're able to be in that heightened environment and bring yourself back to where you truly you're are familiar with more elements think about it like this if you go home and you go hang out with your family and you're super close with them you're going to be able to give a speech to them a lot better than you would to 500 people because you're familiar with the faces you're familiar mm -hmm. with the people there's it's it's a familiarity and like you said it's a composure and uh i don't know where this, exactly where i'm going with that but essentially you know you're able to execute at a lot higher level and that being said you had floyd didn't you Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> I got caught up in the hype. I love the hype. I love it. I, I, was, I was McGregor within three rounds. Oh, my in gosh. My heart. What's, crazy is, what's crazy is I love I loved the way he did everything leading up to it. I thought it was I thought it was like I just thought it was great. But at the end of the day, you got to take that emotion out of it. And you got to say, like, bro, there was guys who do this for a living who couldn't hit Floyd. Here's the thing. 
people still are like, I see even memes out now, and this is might strike people wrong. Don't get me wrong, it would have been cool. I, I'm not, I'm indifferent to who wins. It's not like I had bread on it. But it's one of those things where, and I wasn't really emotionally invested in either fighter. Connor obviously got me to a level where I was like, hell yeah, like, yo, I, I appreciate you being this audacious of yourself and believing in yourself that much. Like, that was a cool thing to witness um, as an athlete. Um, but what you have to do is you take that emotion out of it and you realize, like, you know, Floyd's done this like crazy. And like I was going to say, I see a lot of memes of people being like, wow, he was able to, you know, bring it to him 10 rounds and more punches than anybody else. Floyd fought a completely different way. I, I hate to say it, but he kind of toyed with him and he allowed him to do certain things that he would never, if it was like a, a legit boxing match with like Manny Pacquiao or De La Hoya, he completely fights a different way. So for him to put on a show like that and allow a certain level, I think you just got to really understand boxing. And I just understand boxing because of my grand, my grandfather boxed and he's, he took he speaks more of the technical side of things of, of like enjoying that, you know, take the emotion out of it. Yeah. Floyd's can be an asshole or whatever, this and that. But if you look at his technical skills, it's like, holy shit, this guy is on a different level, yeah. you know? So to be able to see that was just kind of one of those things that was pretty, uh, it was pretty awesome to see. Yeah. But so I, enjoy, I did enjoy Connor and his uh, shenanigans leading up to it. I thought that was awesome. Yeah. It was funny because before the fight, I have just been listening to a lot of stuff and talking about it all the time. Usually just to Julie because she's the only one right there. And, uh, <laughs> so then she asked me the day of the fight. She said, so who do you think is going to win? And I said, my heart is telling me Connor, but my head is telling me Floyd. And that's exactly how the fight played out. In my heart, the first round, I was like, oh, shit, he's yeah. going to get him. And then very quickly, I realized, oh, he's just toying with him, like you said. And then just took him into deep waters and finished him. And you let him extend himself. And when you realize it, that when you watch the whole fight, if you look at it back on it, it's just one of those where you're like, he set him up the entire time. Yeah, and it was just, wow. yeah. which is incredible. Because uh, he set me up too. Because I was like, oh shit, Connor's going to win this. And then just, <laughs> just caught him in the trap. So uh, that's all I had for you today. I feel like we could go on for a little bit longer, but... I think that's a good place to end it. I Once again, I truly appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom. As we were going there, I was taking some notes. And uh, actually, I'll just bring it up one more time. But that one thing you said really stuck with me of people being willing to work for another man or woman harder than they're willing to work for themselves. And if people get anything out of this, I think that one thing should hit home and should make them realize that you are truly the only person who you should be willing to work the hardest for because that is going to have the biggest impact on the people around you. And that's what it's all about. So I appreciate you. Thank you once again. I love you. And let's do this again. Thanks, bro. I appreciate you having me on, man. It's been such a pleasure.